Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures.io. It's my pleasure to welcome Lynette Lim of Philip Capital for today's webinar, How to Choose a Futures Broker. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the questions box and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. And as always, please share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. And without further delay, I will hand it over to Lynette. You will get the pop-up again to share your screen. It's on your uh, note screen. Can you see it? Can you all see the screen? Yeah, it's, it's uh, showing your note screen. Uh, you should be able to click the drop down beneath the play button to change screens to the one that has the presentation on it. There we go. Looking good. Okay, hi, um, my name is uh, Lynette, uh, and I'm the co-CEO of Philip Capital today, uh, Cap Capital Inc. Uh, I have my colleagues here with me to give me moral support, um, and I also have with me uh, JJ, who's the e-trading manager, um, and will be able to help you help answer any questions um, later on. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, we want to talk to you today about Philip Capital, what we're about, but also about the things that you need to think about when you're considering uh, choosing a futures broker, an FCM or an IB, okay? Um, things may seem complex, but my intention is to break it up simply, and we hope that this presentation will be informative and uh, interactive for you. Again, please do ask uh, any questions you have after. Okay. Uh, this is just to make sure that my compliance department is happy uh, so uh, read this for a few seconds, and we'll go. Okay, so I have a question for you, um, just to think about it um, before we start. So when you are opening an account with a futures broker or FCM, what are the considerations, the factors that you think about? Okay, wh what are they? Uh, so let's do a survey here, and I'll pass it on. Um, to uh, Terry to do the survey. Okay, um, it is. Okay, survey is on the screen, so we'll give you a few minutes. So th the answers might be any of them, and but just choose your best answer and what you think on top of your head. Okay, we're about 45 seconds. I'm going to let it go about a minute, and then I will close the poll. Okay, poll is closing. All right, there's the results. The number one is re reputation of the firm with 52%. Okay, interesting. Follow, followed by commissions at 22 and then trading platform at 13. Okay, okay. Hi, Paul is going away, and it's back to your slide. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So, yeah, when, when you're thinking about it, um, you know, many people come to us, uh, is it lowest commission? Is it the day margin? Is it a platform? Um, most likely, what other people choose? Is it the reputation, or is it just the service? Uh, so while you, um, these are important things to think about, 
uh, you, you also need to think about how about the financial stability of the firm and, and other factors. Uh, you, you need to think about those things. So let's look at this and think about that. Um, so we remember these stories, okay? So think about, and these happened very recently. So in PFG in 2011, uh, the CEO, Russell, um, he stole 225 million of customer sec funds, um, which resulted in the company um, declaring bankruptcy. And he fooled the regulators into thinking that he had the money in the bank account by falsing the bank statements. Okay, consider the next event, uh, MF Global in 2011, uh, also, um, that time when John Cozine, Cozine was the CEO and the firm had a shortfall of $1.5 billion in customers' money due to uh, large excessive bets on the European sovereign bet, uh, debt. And unfortunately, this led to a domino effect of a series uh, of things that led to the downfall of the firm and they had to declare bankruptcy. So while the aftermath of all these events uh, resulted um, oops, sorry, hang on. Um, in the um, tightening of the regulators by regulators, uh, and you know, in terms of more frequent reporting, risk monitoring, uh, rules regarding SEC funds, um, and all this work done for the purpose of, um, again, protecting the customers, um, are you really protected? Okay, so the important thing to think about is, as a customer, as a trader, uh, you you don't want to be the one wearing blinkers and not know uh, what is happening. You need to understand and you need to um, find out more and think about more carefully when you're choosing SEM because it matters, right? It, it matters um, greatly. Uh, and, and some of uh, my colleagues here who have worked in these previous firms can attest to that. So the world is full of obvious things that nobody by any chance observe. Okay, my favorite uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, so let's let's be truth seekers like Sherlock Holmes um, and, and think about it. And if we want to be truth seekers, what, what do we need to do, right? We, we need to ask the right questions. Okay, the right questions. And, and what are the right questions? So let me suggest to you some of the right questions to ask. Okay, so first question. Who are they, right? And when you think about a, a broker, what, what is their story? What is their track record? Second question, what is the business? Um, what, what do they do exactly, right? Are they clearing members of the exchange? Are they engaged in other businesses that could maybe jeopardize the business, the main business they're doing? Do they prop trade? Um, the third question, what, what is the soul of the company? What, what do they mean, okay? Uh, fourth, uh, what is their compliance track record? Um, you know, what is their relationship like with the regulators? Uh, five, uh, what is the capital of the firm and what is the excess capital even? Six, what is the treasury policy? And seven, what are their risk policy and what type of customers uh, do they have? Okay, so by asking these questions and these answers, you can find out a bit more of the firm and then you can think about it. How do you find, you know, how to choose the firm that you want? So, um, because we're about Philip Capital, so let's put Philip Capital to these questions. Okay. Uh, again, if uh, you think I'm going too fast, um, Terry can please stop me or something. So first question, who are they? What is your story, right? And it's like finding someone on your first date. When you're interested, you ask all these questions about that person because you want to know that person because it is a relationship. Um, just like us, when you're opening an account with us, we also want to know more about you it's because it's a relationship. So this is our story. Uh, we are uh, a futures commission merchant here and broker dealer. We're based in Chicago. Uh, we're part of the Philip Capital Group um, that started in Singapore in 1975. Uh, and we started in 2010 uh, here in Chicago. Uh, we have membership, um, exchange memberships um, of all the US exchanges. Uh, and we provide also access to major and Asian and international and through our relationships uh, with our affiliate and um, around the world. We are in 16 countries. Okay. 
Um, sorry, hold on a second. I can't read all my notes. So. Uh, so then what happened is, uh, what is our story, right? So in 2008, uh, basically what happened after uh, Lehman crisis, uh, we were shortfall of uh, about 20 million in the customer sec funds. Um, and um, so Philip, um, we didn't, we, we had a shortfall because of what happened to Lehman Brothers. We couldn't get the money out. And while we decided to make the customer whole, um, and waited for the bankruptcy to take its course, we decided that we do need to be self-clearing to reduce counterparty risk and control. And um, then we decided to, that's why we decided to expand to US to meet the demands of our increasing US market volume. Uh, so as a group in Philip, we are more than a million customers worldwide. We have about 30 billion uh, customer funds and we have a white product offering. Okay, second question. What is their business? Are they clearing members of the exchange? Um, are they engaged in other business that could jeopardize this business? And do they pop trade? So maybe I'll pause here for a moment um, just to explain the difference between, uh, you know, the different things because uh, in the big world, we all call futures broker, right? But what does that mean? So there is an FCM, there's a clearing FCM, and there's an IB. Uh, so a Ninja Trader, for example, who is our partner, um, they are an IB of us, um, for, for us, and we are the clearing FCM, okay? So an FCM is a regulated entity by NFA, and we are able to hold the customer's funds. Uh, an IB is also regulated. Um, they need less capital and they manage um, the customer relationships, but they have to go through an FCM to hold the customer's funds. Um, the difference between a clearing FCM then is that the clearing FCM has a direct relationships with the exchange um, because we're members of the exchange. Okay, so what is our business? So for Philip, like we said, we are a clearing FCM. We're only agency, so which means that we serve the customers. We do not prop trade. Uh, why does it matter whether you prop trade or not? The, it matters because um, we want to be on the same side as you. We do not want to think about trading and all that. We want to be servicing you, right? So there is potential conflict of interest. Not all the time, but sometimes. Okay, so, so we just don't want that complication, so we don't prop trade. Uh, and, and that's a very important distinction to think about because um, there are firms who do that. Uh, we are, and then like we said, we are clearing members of the following exchanges. Okay. And recently we became a broker dealer as well, so we can also clear securities. Okay, so the third question asks, what, what is the soul of the firm? So every person has a soul, right? And I'm not trying to be new edgy and, you know, foo-foo or whatever, or high vibe, but everyone has a soul. And even a company has a collective soul about it, right? Even America has a soul in a way. And how the soul is determines what the company does. So let me give you an example, and you would be very clear about that. So Apple versus Google, um, and of course, United versus Southwest. So I lived in Silicon Valley for a while before I moved to this cold place called Chicago. And uh, we have family and friends both working at Apple and Google, right? And you can tell it's day and night how the company works so differently. Um, so Apple is extremely focused. It's very product centric. It's focused on perfection. Everyone is doing the same thing at, at one project. 
um, they don't have millions of products, they have a, a few products, right? Not millions of iPhones, just a few. In Google, uh, it's millions of projects happening at once, it's chaotic, and whether the project is um, being successful or not, it's whether the programmers are interested in it or not. So if the developers are not interested in it, basically you won't do. So I had a friend who was working as a project manager there. He had to beg the programmers to um, get them to um, work on his project. So an example is when I was living there um, and we were um, close to Google, um, where it's called Mountain View, where that is, where it has no mountain and no view, but that's the place. And uh, there was a promise of free Wi-Fi throughout the whole place, except that it never worked. And that was because um, the developers did not work on it anymore and they were busy doing other things. So again, very different, the soul and the culture, right? And of course, the famous or infamous uh, United versus Southwest, both flying planes, right? Both get you from A to B, but again, offering a very different customer service. So, so what is the soul of Philip? Um, so let me, we have a long ethic list and I, I don't want to share with you that ethic list because it, it would bore you to tears. But I, I think very clearly for us, our motto in Philip is that we want to be your partners in finance. And, and what this means is that we stand alongside you as a partner. Um, we are not traders ourselves, so we are not in the game when you lose so that we can win. Um, and one of the ethical quotes, ethical quotes that we stand by is that we play positive sum, right? So what does that mean? So it means that whatever business that you do, we need to make all the shareholders, everyone, all the stakeholders happy, right? Whether you are the shareholders, the employees, the customers must all win. It cannot be, oh, only the shareholders win and then nobody else wins or even the customer win and we don't win because that's not a sustainable model. It has to be the three party winning. Um, and even for us here, um, we, we want to be transparent with what we do. We want to be fair. So that's why uh, even this presentation that we're presenting, it's not the typical, um, here's a, how great my company is, how this, but to really tell you and think through these lists and how do we fare in that list and, and, and explain to you clearly. Because we do want you to know um, as a customer what you're in for. Okay, so at the heart of it, I think what our role is in Philip. Um, is that we have a duty to you to serve you to do what is right. Um, uh, and um, that is what I believe. Okay, fourth question. Uh, what is their compliance track record? Okay. So how do you check the compliance of a firm? Uh, you can um, if you want to generally research on a broker, you go to NFA Basic. They would give you a list of um, the company, who are the principals are, uh, and any of the fines or citations that they have. Okay, and and you can read um, different things about it. If you want to see whatever the latest fines, latest um, law enforcements, you can also go to the next link to look at it. Right. So let's look at Phillips. Uh, Okay, so this is our track record. Um, so if you look carefully at the blue box uh, here, you will see that we had two from the exchange. And if you read in detail, it, it's quite a minor thing. Uh, and every else is zero. Okay, we, we don't have anything. Um, and they are immaterial. Um, and I'm not to say that, oh, if another logical thing to think about is a longer a firm has been around, the more they would have. Um, so you, we do expect some, um, but if they have a lot, then that's something as a red flag, right? But you have to read it case by case. But like I said, um, for any brokers that you are using with now, we encourage you to look at this uh, list. And even if you have a AP or I mean a salesperson that you're working with, you can also look up his name and see um, his record as well, right? Or what all the companies that he has worked for. Okay, the fifth question, um, which is an interesting one. What is the capital of the firm? Okay. So understanding capital. 
uh, capital is uh, very important to any running of the business, right? You run a business, you need money to capital. And it's especially important for a clearing FCM um, because we have this thing called regulatory capital that we need. Uh, and why do we need so much money? Um, because as an FCM, we are the counterparty risk to the exchange. So what happens if, as a customer, if you do not pay or you have a sudden loss and there's a big debit, we have to take the hit. We pay first to the exchange um, before anything else. Okay, so, so therefore, uh, the exchange wants companies with capital in order to um, be an FCM. Uh, and the minimum regulatory capital uh, of any FCM um, needs to be 8% of the customer's overnight margin, right? So that doesn't mean that a company is 8%. It means that means they need to have in excess of this 8%. Okay, if we really hit 8%, we're actually in big trouble. For that. Uh, hold on clear. So how do you find the capital of the firm, right? You, you want to figure it out. So if you want to find capital and it's all there, uh, it's updated every month, um, go to this uh, website, uh, CFTC um, has this report that shows all the latest uh, FCMs and all that doing. Okay, so I, I show you the magnified um, picture of it. And then from the magnified picture, you can see all these different numbers. So for example, like what we are, what we're registered is, who is our registered DSRO, this is our registered um, regulator, the date that this is updated, um, our net capital and our excess net capital, um, our SEC funds, how much money we have of the customers. Um, again, um, feel free to ask questions as it goes along. So what is um, Philips Capital, right? So uh, extrapolating from that, and um, I did this slide August 24th. Um, essentially, our own our net capital is about 38 million. Um, our requirement from that eight point, the eight percent um, that we need is 15 million. So we have excess capital of 18 million, and we have about total customer funds of 300 uh, million. Um, so again, as you know this amount will keep fluctuating as customers put in money or you open an account and, or you withdraw money, this, this number is fluctuating all the time, right? Uh, so what conclusion we can give you is that we're very well capitalized among the peers and we have excess capital to grow. So if you notice people with um, the excess capital is very low, let's say 1 million or 2 million, they don't have much room to grow, right? Um, so that's, that's something to note. Oops. And what's the Philip Capital Group? So we were talking just now about our own firm here, right? But and there's a group consolidated basis. Uh, we have uh, more than 1.5 billion uh, shareholders equity. Um, so we are a private company. Uh, we have made profit in over 40 years um, around as a whole group. Uh, we do not have any long-term debt. Uh, and as I said, we're private owned. Um, owned. Um, the founders of the company are still very active. Um, the founder is my dad, um, and he's still very active, as uh, many can testify, because last night we're still in a very long conference call with him, uh, for better or worse. Okay. <laughs> So number six, uh, what are your treasury policies? Okay, so so treasury policy is basically, uh, the meaning is how a company handles the money. Where do they put the money in? Okay, that, that's the short form of treasury policy. Uh, and maybe FCMs may not want you to know this, but we make money in two ways, right? First way we make money is uh, um, what you know, commissions and fees. And the second one is the interest earned from treasuries. We, we make money from the interest that you put in deposit with us. Uh, so we use the deposit to place into different instruments and earn interest. Okay. Uh, 
we are allowed by uh, regulators to invest in different sets of instruments, um, and they are all approved by exchange. So there is a balancing act, right, between trying to get the maximum yield that we can possibly get versus how safe the instrument is, right? And in 2008, uh, many firms got in trouble um, and experienced loss, and some FCMs actually um, declared bankruptcy because of a fund called Sentinel, if some of you remember. Uh, and in fact, the interest rates at that time was like 10%. So one firm had to close down um, because they put 80% of their funds in that instrument, right? They put all their eggs in that basket. Um, so the moral of the story, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true, right? So again, like I said, the, the uh, how the company handles the treasury is also important um, because it's a balancing act. Uh, so what are Philip's uh, treasury policies? Uh, we hold a very conservative approach. Okay, we because again, like we said, we have a very strong fiduciary duty towards our customers and towards our shareholders, um, uh, and, and that's what keeps us awake at night, right? So we we hold we do hold a significant portion of the money in cash, um, and to ensure that we're liquid and U.S. Treasury uh, securities. Um, and we also invest in short-term funds um, and money market instruments. And our average maturity uh, these are in twin, uh, about 20 months. And we again, we declare this, um, what we put in every, in our website all the time, um, updated. So you can check our website and see. Okay, number seven, um, what are their risk policies and how are they enforced? So we talked earlier again about the balancing act, right, between risk and return. And again, all financial uh, business, including uh, yours uh, as a trader, right, is about risk and return. Okay, so so we we have to think about this all the time. So the type of business that FCM is willing to take will also determine the amount of risk they take, take, right? So you want to look at when you look at an FCM or a futures broker, you want to look at what are the business that they are taking? Because are they taking extra risk by doing that? Um, and again, I'm not saying take no risk because if you take no risk, means no business, um, but it has to be measured, right? So naked option selling, um, concentration of one single customer or even one single product, um, extremely low day margins without proper ways to cut um, positions. Okay, that's also a danger of rate flag. Um, whether they have real-time risk monitoring tools um, and ability to execute, you know, 24-hour execution, that's also a vital thing. So what is Philip's uh, risk policies like and how they enforce? So for Philip Capital, we take a holistic view towards risk management. We don't think risk is just market risk. There are plenty of other risk around. Um, so as you see from the circle, you can see there's market risk, legal risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, foreign, uh, you know, and, and, we, and we look at all these carefully every month and it's uh, reported to senior management. Um, if any of these things are breached or in danger of, right, like you said, like we said before, uh, we do not prop trade um, and we have our own prop, uh, a proprietary risk management that sends out the breach reports. Uh, and we have also a 24-hour execution team. So anyway, this is a conclusion of um, thing that these are the seven questions to ask. So as I recap, uh, again, think about it. Uh, who are they? What is the story? What is their track record? Uh, second, what is the business they do? Are they direct clearing members? Uh, what is the soul of the firm? Number four, what is the compliance track record? Five, what is the capital? Uh, six, what is their treasury policy? And seven, what is their risk policy? Uh, so again, uh, thank you for listening and I hope you will consider us when choosing a futures broker. Okay, thank you. Okay. If you have any questions, feel free to start typing them and then I will start asking away. What trading platforms do y'all support? I will let JJ. Um, I'll let JJ answer the question. Hang on. So we are 
platform agnostic, as they say. We offer CQG um, and anything that plugs into CQG, any um, front end or uh, private label platform that plugs into CQG. Also, uh, Rhythmic, TT, Option City, CTS, and also Ninja Trader. So pretty much a wide variety. And Ninja Trader, um, again, as you open directly with them, um, and they service you, we keep the account, right? Um. Okay. So would it, if you have Ninja Trader, could they they request Philip instead of them clearing through someone else? Because I thought yes. Ninja cleared through Dorming. Uh, so now you know that uh, they they can clear through uh, us. Okay. Uh, do y'all support forex trading? We do not support forex trading in the U.S. In other countries, we have um, forex. So the other countries are Australia, Hong Kong, UK, UK uh, Singapore. Okay, I guess to follow up with that, so it is strictly futures, no stock options or anything else? Stock options and equities are on the way uh, okay. for, for, for opening it here. Do you provide uh, VIX and RVX data feeds through NinjaTrader? We, we do offer VIX through NinjaTrader. I think they have not made the request. So as long as they make the request, we can do it. Okay. Uh. What, uh, uh, I'm trying to see here. Uh, a lot of questions are going to be about trading platform. <laughs> Let me see real quick. Uh, Do you accept IRA accounts? Yes, for sure. Okay. And uh, do you have any offerings in terms of mobile platforms, mobile trading platforms? So, yes. Um, CQG has a few mobile offerings, uh, specifically CQGM. Um, it's a browser based, so uh, on your mobile phone or tablet, all you need to do is open up your browser and um, and you could use CQGM on your phone or tablet. Uh, CTS T4 also offers a, uh, a mobile app that we carry. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, just, uh, I think another question that I think people might ask, you know, Obviously, would be what would be the minimum to open an account? Yes, that's so just for us would be five thousand to open directly with us. But like you said, I said, um, if you want to open through Ninja Trader or other of our IBs that we support, um, they have other different criteria. Okay. And what is the margins compared to the rest of the industry? Day margins, you mean? Yes. The day margins, um, I think our risk manager, he's not here now, but usually we will offer half and then if we, um, and then he would case by case decide to lower it or not. But uh, like you said, we are not very aggressive in our day margins um, and that's not what kind of we, we do. But okay. we, can, we, we, can, we can see what the, what the case is. Okay. Uh, 
There's a question on when will you provide free ACH transfers to and withdrawals from the account? Uh, that's a good question uh, because actually we do offer ACH. Uh, we don't offer ACH through Ninja because uh, they did not want that. Uh, so that that's, but we do have ACH if you open directly with us. Okay. Uh, And what are your costs compared to other firms? Uh, what what kind of cost? Um, I'm assuming we're going to be talking about commissions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Competitive, if not better. Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what the angle of the question is. I think the the thing is also that we are clearing members of the exchanges, so that means that we go directly and um, we do not have any um, what they call it like a, a a cost for that. And also we have our own back office, so we don't have any cost for that. So our marginal cost is relatively low. So I would say we want to be competitive. Okay. All right, if there's any other questions, please feel free to start typing them. Uh, can we have an example of cost for ES Mini for intraday? I'll let the sales person. <laughs> so, so um, our, our costs are 99 cents for commissions. Um, so round turn, that's a dollar ninety-eight. Um, so if you're going to trade a one lot, it's a dollar ninety-eight for commissions, and then you're going to pay somewhere around a dollar thirty, I believe, for an exchange fee. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, depending on your volume, the example I just gave you is a one lot. Um, you know, if you're going to trade significantly, significantly more per month than um, our teams are happy to work with you um, to bring that commission rate down, but that's sort of uh, the standard example for a one lot. Okay. Uh, so if you want to um, give us the like, yeah, the volume that you do, or show us an, um, your statement and equity, um, the the sales guys can you know um, definitely match whatever that's on the market. Okay. Um, what Asian exchanges do you offer access to? The gamut, I think. Uh, you yeah, to, uh, TOCOM, SGX, which is Singapore, uh, JPX in Japan, um, and um, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Australia, Thailand, and Thailand. Malaysia, Malaysia um, the Bursa, Bursa and uh, DGCX. Okay. I think that is it on the questions. I'm going to give him another minute to slide one in. Okay. I think that is it. Thank you for the webinar today, for the information, and for most importantly, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you can you bring up on your screen a, I guess, the contact page of your website or something that we can oh, leave them leave them there, so if they have any further questions. Oh, there you go. Perfect. If they have any further questions that weren't answered today, or you're watching this later on YouTube, you can uh, contact them directly here, and they will take care of you. Thank, thank you, Terry. Terry. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yep. Bye.